my name's Nicola White. I'm a mudlark and artist and I'm out on the Thames estuary today in Higham in Kent where I'm doing some beach combing. on the Thames Estuary today it's a beautiful day and my aim is to collect some plastic but as I was walking along I've come across this group of people here who have also clearly been collecting plastic um, can you please tell us what you're doing and, and who okay. you are yes yeah, surely um, hello uh, my name is Mark Gallant I'm a senior partnership officer at the North West Kent Countryside Partnership and today I've been out with my volunteers and we've been collecting plastic rubbish from the Thames foreshore as part of the Preventing Plastic Pollution project. We have an awful lot of plastic bottles and we've collected today, I think over nearly 300 or so. 300? Yeah, just, and it was only on along a, a short stretch of the river. I suppose the, the most numerous uh, item of plastic pollution is sweets and crisp wrappers. So note to all you young people out there, don't drop your crisp packets after you've eaten them because they might end up in a river and then out to sea, get washed out to sea. Well, thank you to you and to all the amazing volunteers. What fantastic work. Thank, thank you, you so thank much. You. to ignore the shocking amount of plastic which is washed up here. I'm literally surrounded by it. So I'd like to find out more about it. So I've decided to take a trip down to Plymouth to meet somebody who knows an awful lot about plastic pollution. Professor Richard Thompson, who is a professor of marine biology at Plymouth University. He's an expert in marine debris and he's also the first person to have coined the term microplastics. So here I am in beautiful Plymouth, also known as Britain's Ocean City, and I'm here to find out a bit more from somebody who knows an awful lot about plastic and plastic pollution. I'm here today everybody with um, Richard Thompson, Professor Richard Thompson, OBE. Richard is Professor of Marine Biology at the University of Plymouth. He's a world leading marine scientist who's carried out a lot of research into the causes and effects of marine litter. Not only that, he's been referred to in Parliament as the godfather of microplastics. So basically, in a nutshell, Richard knows a heck of a lot about plastic. So he's a brilliant person to be here talking to today. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak to not, us today. Not at all. Thank you for coming down to Plymouth to speak to us. Oh, my great pleasure. And for the benefit of myself and my viewers, I wonder if you could first um, explain to us what does a marine biologist just do? That's really, it, it, it's a really good question and it's one that actually I often get asked by students and potential students on an open day at the university and it's a really broad topic that actually allows you to go in a lot of different directions. It's easy to think of biology and we start to think perhaps of the marine life, the whales and dolphins but even the microscopic plankton but if you're studying marine biology it's so much more than that because the thing that affects those creatures however big or small is the environment they live in the temperature of the water, the salinity of the water, 
Creatures that live in sediment, the nature of the sediment itself, is it fine grains or like beach sand? And all of that is driven by physical and chemical processes. So you need to have a very broad understanding of science. So it's biology plus the other sciences. But then if you want any of that to matter in the world, it's about communication. It's about translating what's down there beneath the surface of the waters that most people don't get the good fortune to see other than perhaps as revealed by David Attenborough on Blue Planet, you've got to be able to tell the story of what's there and how we might be influencing it for better or for worse. Now, I know that you founded and you head the Marine Litter Research Unit here at the university, and you've charted the global distribution of microplastics, for example, in the Arctic ice and the deep seas. And so just going back to that distribution of plastic for a moment, when I'm walking along the Thames estuary and mudlarking on the River Thames, I come across an awful lot of plastic, and some of my viewers will have seen that. And I'm just wondering if you could tell me how much plastic makes its way into our oceans each year. We know that the global production of plastic is somewhere between 360 million tonnes and 400 million tonnes of plastic every year. And estimates are that about 10% of that ends up out there in the ocean. What are some of the effects that this plastic has once it's in our oceans? And and you know, why should we be worried about what happens in the oceans and the ecosystems? You know, we're talking about pieces right the way from probably nanoparticles, far too, too small to see to the naked eye, even actually below the level of our detection equipment, right up to pieces of plastic that are so big, you can literally see them from satellites in space. So there's this enormous range of different sizes. Their potential to cause harm is going to vary immensely between something that's so small, even one of the smallest planktonic creatures in the sea behind us could potentially ingest it. So if you're looking at the risks associated with plastic, there are many, but it isn't something you could encapsulate in one number. You know? So it's clear to me that there are economic effects. And for some, that's the currency, that's, that's the unit to put it in. You, know, you look at the cost that's spent in cleanup, and that's not cleanup of all of our coastlines, it's just cleanup of some of the parts if we take the UK, for example, the parts that we care about financially, the ports and harbours, the tourist beaches, it's been estimated that the cost of cleanup just of those small areas of coastline could be in excess of £20 million every year. Then you could turn to it and you could look at the effects of wildlife. And we've documented these for the Convention on Biological Diversity. Over 700 species known to encounter plastics. Some of those encounters, it's not clear what the consequence was, but in many cases we've got clear evidence of harm and in some cases mortality for a wide range of different species caused by small and large pieces of plastic. And finally, of course, something that, that's sort of close to many of our hearts is, well, what's the effect on us, on, on, on humans? And that's something that we know less about, I'd argue, because it's much harder for us to do a scientific experiment on a human. I can't give you a dose of plastic and see how you respond to it. It wouldn't be ethical. But we do have emerging evidence. We know that there's a range of chemicals of concern that are used in, in plastics. And some of those are regulated for, for infants, for example, or for use in hospitals where the, the pathway to us is, is quite high. But that's the direct use of the plastic. Is there a problem to us as humans from the litter in the ocean sort of coming back to haunt us? And there are concerns about that. A study that we did here in Plymouth, we looked at hundreds of fish from the English Channel, and we found that over a third of all the fish we looked at across 10 different species, over a third of them had got microplastics in them. Now, those, some of those species were commercially important. They're gonna to come to your dinner plate. The plastic that we counted was mostly in the guts of those creatures. Typically, you're taking the gut out of the fish. So probably the exposure pathway is quite small, but nonetheless, there is a potential for that transfer. Actually, if you're asking me, should I stop eating fish and shellfish because of the plastic? The answer is definitely no. I'm far more concerned that the fish and shellfish you eat is sustainably caught or harvested than I am about the plastic that's in it. So we've got economic effects, we've got effects on wildlife, and we've got a range of emerging effects, some of them more behavioural and psychological, on, on human health and well-being. And I suppose currently, the way we're going, it's only going to get worse. I read that you'd actually said that most of the plastic, uh, unless it's been incinerated, that we've been creating since the 1960s, is probably still here somewhere 
on this planet. So, I mean, if we continue as we're going, it's, it's quite horrifying to think of those beaches um, just becoming more and more uh, polluted with the plastic. It is horrifying because the plastics are incredibly durable. You look at the production curve for plastics and we've gone from 5 million tonnes of plastic produced globally in the 1950s to somewhere in excess of 360 million tonnes today. That's a curve that looks like that. I mean, it's outpacing, I mean, some of it is related to the growth in the human population since the 1950s, but the growth in our use of plastics is outstripping that by an order of magnitude. It's really clear to me that because we're finding plastics everywhere we go on a global scale, that this kind of what I would call a press disturbance at an ecosystem-wide scale that's altering our interaction with the natural world because of this even small quantities of litter accumulating in the environment. But let's be clear, that's because plastics bring benefit to society. And, and that's, the juxta that's the thing we've got to juxtapose. How do we keep those benefits, which are undeniably there, without these, and I'd say, if I'm generous, I'd say largely unintended consequences at, of the plastic at the end of its lifetime or the wear of fibres from textiles or the wear of, of plastic from, from, from tyres as we drive along um, the roads. How do, we, how do we get the thing we want without these unintended consequences? Yeah. And that's, the, that's going to be the, the trick. It's not, in my view, about banning plastics from our lives. I think that would bring even greater environmental risk and loss to society. It's about using plastics more responsibly. It's obvious when you see a large piece of plastic, like lots of bottles and yogurt pots and, and crisp packets when I'm walking along, but it's easy to forget about those things that you can't see. Yep. And so that's why this issue of microplastics is very interesting. And I know some of your research and recommendations has led to the banning of certain microplastics, such as um, something, you know, initially, which I didn't even realise was made of plastic, because, I mean, I use all sorts of face creams and things, but um, the exfoliating ones, I didn't realise that so many of those used to have plastic balls in them um, instead of little pieces of biodegradable stuff. And so, thanks to you, that's been banned, because I can only imagine that that wouldn't be particularly great for the environment, to have lots of these tiny little microplastic balls in the sea. It's one source of plastic to the ocean, and I think it was a totally unnecessary yeah. source. I mean, it wasn't just me. It was worked on uh, by my team. We came, became aware that there were plastic on so many of these rinse-off cosmetic uh, products. And it was a, you know, a very hard-working and talented PhD student called Imogen Napper. And, I, and, I, and we had a discussion. I said, look, Imogen, let's start counting them. And she went through all of these products and counted them, not one by one, but once you've looked at the size of them, you can extract them, you can weigh them, you can estimate how many are there. And in, you know, a single container of two or three hundred mil, she was finding in the region of three million particles. I mean, it's an incredible number. Thousands and thousands are going to escape down the plug hole every time you have a shower. And there's nothing you as a consumer can do about that. You can't take these little bits to be recycled. So it's inevitable they're going to pass to wastewater treatment. Now, some of them will be intercepted there in the wastewater treatment, but a good number will escape to the environment. And at that time, we were starting to see reports from the Great Lakes in North America, uh, reports that people were finding these small pieces of plastic that, were, that very clearly resembled the pieces of the microbeads in, in cosmetics. And I'm left asking the question, did nobody in the industry ever wonder where are these hundreds of thousands of tons of plastic that we're putting into cosmetic products year on year? Where are they all going? And does it matter? And, and that's the thing that has to change. We can't rely on a smart environmental scientist spotting something that is poor industrial practice that could cause a problem, counting it, supplying the evidence, delivering it to Parliament in the hope that there might be legislation. And that's the solution to all of it. It's about thinking about things from the design stage and making sure we're minimising the impact on the one planet that we've got. Yeah, well, I mean, I, obviously, on behalf of an awful lot of people, I'd like to say a big, very big thank you for the work that you and people like Imogen have done. I was really happy to see recently that um, plastics, forks and spoons and things are soon to be eliminated. And I know that as well, through your research and work, um, single-use plastic bags have been um, phased out, which is great news. And I am sure that nobody, nobody who's watching this video wants to go for a walk on a beach and they don't want their children to go walking on the beach 
beach with so much plastic around. And so I know that you're very focused on solutions and we all want to have hope that we yeah. can make a difference uh, instead of focusing forever on the negative issues. Um, so, I mean, how can we, and I know it's very hard perhaps to think that we can't make a difference, but how can we make a, a, a difference? This is help? a problem that can be solved um, and, and it will take action from all of us. And I think we're in a very different, much more positive position than we were when I first started working on this, this, this problem of plastic in the environment, which was 25 years ago now. Because in the beginning, there was not alignment that there was a problem. Public policy and industry saw it in very different ways and there was denial that there was even a problem there in the first place. I would say now that actually industry, policy and the public are all agreed that the current practices with design and use and disposal of plastics are unsustainable. Thank you very much again. And lastly, a question totally unrelated to plastic actually, but I did notice that you met Prince Charles, now King of course, and I just wanted to know, I mean, are you able to tell me what was it like to meet him? What's he like? Yeah, well, I met His Royal Highness when he was Prince of Wales on a number of occasions. Um, and, you know, his passion for the environment is absolutely clear. I mean, that's why I've ended up meeting him on, you know, more than one occasion. Um, and, you know, he's always asking incredibly pertinent questions about the issue and about the solutions. And, you know, it was actually a, a, a sort of a piece of his own work where we heard that he'd buried some of his jumpers in the garden to see how they degraded that, that led us to look at some of the work on biodegradation of materials in the marine environment behind us and uh, in the university garden. So he's taken a real interest in this and a real stance for, for the environment. And, you know, it's great to see, you know, world leaders, important international figures taking that stance because they can help to turn the dial. Thank you very much for taking the time to talk to me and my viewers today. It's been so valuable and I've learned such a lot and I'm sure that my viewers have as well. Thank you very much to Professor Richard Thompson. I've certainly learned a lot about plastics. And I'm having another wonderful day down here on the Thames Estuary. I hope you like my fish. I'll be bagging him up and taking him home with me, but I won't be having him with chips for dinner. <laughs> <laughs>